Nat Morris here from Cumulus Networks. He will uh, talk about uh, his open install, uh, open network install environment called Oni. And yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Nat from uh, Cumulus Networks. We're a startup based in Mountain View in California. Um, we came out of stealth mode in June last year. Um, and we have a network operating system that runs on top of, uh, top of rack switches in the data center. Um, can I see a show of hands for people that use Pixie to deploy their servers in the data center? OK. And has anyone tried to change the firmware or jailbroken um, a network device at home, like a WRT router or a Linksys device at all? And anybody used U-Boot at all? Or a JTAG programmer? OK, a few people. <laughs> um, so uh, this morning, I'm going to go through um, only what the project's about, um, where it's used, uh, what we've learned during the development. Um, and I'll do a couple of demos of it as well. Um, so first of all, I'll just talk about why we need ONI um, in the uh, network market space at the moment, and what it enables us to do, and what, it, what it's changing in the, in the industry. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the, the landscape in the data center, the, the, um, the IP vendors, you see on the, um, the left-hand side, we have um, open vendors. And on the right-hand side, the ones that are closed. And by, by um, the way um, we mean closed in this discussion is uh, people like Cisco or Juniper or Arista who ship a closed unit. You get the hardware with the operating system. It's all wrapped up. You just get a single binary. Um, you don't get any source code. You don't get access to the raw hardware. Um, and what Cumulus our, ourselves and um, our competitors in, in this market, like Big Switch and Pico 8 are doing, is, is, is we're trying to separate the, the hardware from the software. Uh, to have some disaggregation. So you can pick the, uh, the hardware vendor of your choice and run a network operating system on top of that. And you can switch it out at any time. Um, so some examples of um, some vendors that are interested in uh, joining this community and, uh, and providing open hardware are people like Quanta, um, who you might have um, come across who t typically build, uh, have built servers, um, or Edgecore, and Dell are now um, in playing in this space as well. So, so some of these, these names might not be familiar, like the, the Quanta or the Edgecore, and that's because they're ODMs from Taiwan. And th they normally build a switch, and then a manufacturer, like someone on the right-hand side, such as Juniper or Arista or Cisco, will purchase that switch and change the front plate and, um, and rebrand it. So you don't normally come across these, these vendors. Um, and, and this is typically um, how, how it's always been. You've had a, a manufacturer like Cisco, and you get this single blob, and we want to um, introduce this split now. So you, you have the hardware at the bottom, you can put it on top of the operating system, and um, in all the cases uh, we've seen, that's, that's, no, that's normally Linux. Um, and then on top of that, you can install your own applications. Um, and the benefit of running Linux on your network switch is that you can manage it really easily. Um, you can treat it just like another server in the data center and, and use the tools that you've been developing uh, for years to manage it, um, like Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt, or your own homebrew, homebrew, homebrew bash scripts. Um, so the, uh, the talk this morning isn't really about our network OS, but it's, it's how do we get those operating systems onto the hardware, and how do we do it um, in kind of a simple, a simple manner and allow people to, to swap the operating system out. So this is um, what a, a typical leaf switch might look like that you put at the top of the rack. Um, this is uh, one from Quanta. It's got uh, 48 uh, 10 gig SFP slots on the front and four 40 gig ports in this example. Um, uh, another model switch very similar to this would be a 1 gig switch with uh, 48 1 gig copper ports and four 10 gig ports. You always have a serial console port. Um, and we tend to see those run at um, 11.5200 now instead of 9600, like on the, the kind of classic sealed units, a lot, a lot faster. And then you'd also get an out of band Ethernet management interface as well. And the, the price point on these, because this is open hardware um, and being sold separately to the, um, the OS, is, is a lot cheaper. You, you'd normally see this unit um, in single volumes for about 4,000 euros, which is a lot cheaper than you'd, you'd normally be paying. Um, and th this is what a, uh, a spine switch might look like in a, in a big data center. In this case, this is a 32 port 40 gig unit. Um, and you can break each of those 40 gig ports up into four 10 gig ports with a splitter cable. So th they're, they're pretty. Um, 
um, pretty standard units. Um, and you can see these don't normally come with any branding because you'd be getting them straight from the, the ODM or via a reseller. Um, so so how, do, how, how, how do we go about pr provisioning the switch? Well, what we've always done um, in, the, in the server world is use, is, is we had the bare metal server at the bottom, and we've always it's come with a BIOS and Pixie, in most cases, to, to do the boots. So when Pixie starts up, it'll do a, a DHCP request. It'll look for some, uh, some options from the DHCP server to get the, uh, the, the file name, and then it'll go through um, using something like ISO Linux to do the install. So we've needed to replicate that for the bare metal market. Um, because when you go to one of these uh, vendors such as Quanta, you'll just get the unit, it'll come with U-Boot on there, and, and that'll be it. It's very hard to do the install. You'll need to be talking through the user about um, telling them on, on the different hardware where, where the, the flash starts and finishes, where, the, what, um, where they can store values in the EEPROM. So we come up with this uh, uh, project called Only, which is the open network installer, which um, we think is a bit like a Pixie Boot on, uh, on steroids. It's um, U-Boots and, uh, and Oni. And we have um, a hardware compatibility list of uh, d devices that we've certified Oni to run on top of. Um, it's available on GitHub and all the documentation and, uh, and source files are up there with a GPL license. So um, now we've been, we've been doing this for a couple of years. We're now starting to see, to see vendors um, highlight Oni compatibility on their data sheets, which is great. Um, and this means you can, um, you can go to a vendor, and as well as getting the, the switch with a classic OS that it came on, maybe some kind of QNX operating system or um, some other kind of vendor-sealed OS, they list it as being only compatible. And that means you can plug different operating systems on top of it at will. So um, maybe if the OS that you're running um, this year in the data center doesn't have um, a layer-free uh, routing stack that you need, um, because, because the switch has got only on there, you can just remove that operating system and install a new one that would, has those features. Or maybe a, an open OS that allows you just to, to run your own um, routing stack in maybe Python or, some, or in Go or whatever you like. Um, and si since this, this uh, market's starting to get a lot of traction, we've seen um, one of the big vendors in January, Dell, announce um, support for only on their switches. So on, in particular, on the Dell S4810 and S6000 switches, um, you can now purchase those from Dell. And um, in the next couple of months, they're going to be adding a feature onto their site. So just as on, on the left-hand side, for a few years now, when you purchase your X, X86 box, you can pick the, the, the network operating system. A uh, question? Okay, so, so in this case, on uh, the... Sorry, please repeat the question. Um, sorry, um, oh. I just wanted to know... What <laughs> <laughs> on mic. <laughs> okay, better. <coughs> sorry. Um, the models you are talking about, mm. are these the Force 10 ones, which Dell took over with the acquisition, or the old OEM ones, which I think uh, are like similar to the quantum SMC ones? SMC boxes. No, so these, um, these are all the, the Dell uh, Force 10 boxes, okay. which come with... Um, typically, they come with the... Trident Plus or Trident 2 chipset in there. So in this case, in the next few months on the Dell site, you're going to see this, um, these radio buttons appear, where you can pick the old Dell OS or the, the Force 10 operating system at the top, the Dell networking OS. You can be able to pick ourselves pre-installed or other network operating system. And that'll mean that the box comes with just only on there, where you could um, either install ourselves or you can install Force 10 or um, another vendor. So, um, follow-on question to that. So, after the switch is booted yep. and the operating system is on it, I mean, you have secret source that speaks to like low-level D ASICs, Trident 2 chipset, etc. Yep. So, I guess it doesn't only need to be only compatible. It also needs to be compatible to your OS to enjoy the greatness of hardware switching, right? Yep. Indeed, and, the, and that's the, the, the element that's not quite as open as we'd like it to be at the moment. Um, because when you're writing a network operating system that runs on top of a, a switch, you need to talk to the ASIC. And traditionally, that's via an SDK that you'd license from the, um, from the, from the merchant silicon vendor, such as Broadcom. And at the moment, those aren't, those aren't um, open. Uh, lots of discussions underway. 
Um, but we're not in that kind of position at the moment. Um, so, so what is ONI? Um, it provides an environment for the network operating system um, installation um, and discovery. Um, it's like a, a, a pre-installed Kickstarter that sits on the box. It's a very, very, very small operating system, just a couple of meg. Um, it's defined by its behaviors, um, and it's based on a, a modern Linux kernel and, uh, and BusyBox. And it's all just written in, in Bash. You can see it all on GitHub. Um, and recently, just before Christmas, it was ratified by the Open Compute Project, um, which you might be aware of is an is a initiative started by Facebook, uh, originally to put out um, hardware designs for servers under an open source license. Um, and now there's people in that group that are developing network switches that they want to release the hardware designs for and the SDK um, in an open manner. Um, but to be able to get the operating system onto the switch in the first place, you need a bootloader. Um, so they picked Oni as, the, as that, that, that their bootloader of choice. Um, so these are the, the vendors at the moment that support, um, that support Oni. The question? Um, on the slide, you say that it's um, affiliated with the Open Compute Project. Yep. Um, has it anything to do with the Open Daylight Project? Are you aware of that? Uh, no. So Open Daylight is a controller for SDN networks. Um, that's completely separate to the OCP project. OK. So o the OCP project is about um, designing, say, uh, servers or racks or power supplies to greatly reduce the cost of hardware going into the data center. And they've, they've kind of had that those elements nailed for a few years now, um, rolling out racks on, on mass and having that hardware produced. And it's now the, the network elements that are missing that they're um, having to suck up to Cisco. And uh, I know the fact is that uh, Facebook alone spend $120 million a year with Cisco just for their top of rack switching. So that, that's the next part that they want to reduce the cost of. Um, so these are the vendors that support, that support Oni. So, all of these um, switch manufacturers, if you look at their, their, um, their product list and their SKUs, you'll normally see two SKUs. You'll see one that says, um, so sort of the Dell S4810 example, it will be the S4810 part code that comes with um, Force 10 OS. And then they'll be listing another part code where the switch is that's just bare metal. It's got nothing on there apart from, um, apart from Oni. And that gives you the, the opportunity to install other, other operating systems. And um, there's also people that, that don't use the Broadcom uh, chipset in this example, um, such, as, such as Mellanox as well. Um, and then there's us operating system vendors. And um, there's myself from, uh, from Cumulus Networks here, and um, our competitors, Big Switch and, and Mellanox. But we've all had to um, put our differences to one side, really, and come up with a standard to get our operating systems onto the switches uh, for the better good of the community. Because we, what we don't want to uh, have to do is people to buy a switch and then sit there with their JTAG programmer, um, uh, configuring the EEPROM and then TFTP loading the operating system, because that, that's, that's no good for any of us. Um, this is what um, a network switch normally looks like. Pre pretty standard design. Um, on the right-hand side, you've got the switching ASIC which has all the front panel ports connected. Maybe they're one gig ports, or 10, or, or 40 gig. Then there's a PCIe bus hooking that up to a, a CPU. It's normally a single uh, system on chip. It's got some RAM, some boot flash, and some mass storage, sometimes in the, in the case of like a CF card um, stuck in the box of a hot glue gun or a SD card on the side of the switch. Um, and that SOC has a serial port and an Ethernet management port. And the, the bit we're concerned about with, with Oni is, is just the left-hand side. We just want to get the operating system onto the flash and, uh, and all, all, all our content onto the, onto the mass storage. Um, it's, that then, it's then the oper operating system's opportunity and, and, and role to, to handle the uh, configuration of the ASIC to actually drive the installation. Any question? Yeah. So in case of a uh, top of rack switch, I mean, that's relatively easy, let's yep. say. Uh, in a chassis-based system, you would need to take care of like downloading microcode to line cards and et cetera, et cetera. So I guess we are far away from being able to uh, do something no, like no, that. No, no, no. Um, you still, in some cases, you still need to download microcode onto the switching ASIC as well. That's a pretty uh, standard operation. Um, as you go through SDK bumps, where for Broadcomer, for example, um, th those SDKs, when the next version gets inst installed and started it for the first time during that initialization process, 
It'll look to see what microcode is installed on the ASIC. So as you install the, your next release of the OS, if it, maybe if the microcode hasn't changed, it won't need to do that install. So even, even in the same one, chassis or top of rack, you still need to go through um, microcode upgrade bumps as a part, part of the course every, 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 uh, every year or so. Um, in, in most cases at the moment, this, this CPUs uh, have normally been a power PC. Uh, in most cases, a P2020 unit, like a single core um, 800 megahertz or 1.6 gigahertz processor. In a lot of cases, they've got maybe 2 gig of RAM and possibly around um, 4 gig of, uh, of, of storage. So this is what happens when, um, when the switch leaves the factory with, with only installed. So we have um, a low-level bootloader. Um, that configures the CPU, um, and that uh, boots only. In most cases, that's, that's U-boot at the moment. Um, then ONI has the Linux kernel with BusyBox. It'll bring up the Ethernet management port, and it will lo locate the OS installer, and that could be a, vi a variety of means that we can get, go for in a minute. And, and ONI provides the tools um, to look after the storage and uh, the environment for the installer. And then we, we grab the, the installer that we find for um, over the network or on local storage, and then we're, we'll, we'll execute that um, and install that onto the uh, onto the storage inside the inside the chip, the, the switch even. Um, once the operating system has been installed, only won't get started. We'll configure the um, a setting in the EEPROM so the network OS is is um, started straight away. Um, only still there that we can um, f uh, flip a bit in the for it to kick in again, um, but normally we just uh, boot straight into the network OS, and it's that network OS that will interface with the ASIC and run all the layer free and layer two protocols that you need, and provide like a CLI or um, that that management interface. So how do, how do we go about doing um, network discovery and install? So we use um, DHCP. IPv4 and IPv6, um, we, we'll uh, configure the network interface, we'll grab DNS, um, server settings, search domain, um, and hostname from DHCP, or you can manually set it. Um, and then we try and locate a network installer, and we, and we do that via a variety of means. Um, we'll look on the local file systems. In some cases, some of these switches are now coming with USB uh, front-facing ports, so you might have an OS on a USB stick that you, that you shove in there. Um, or in most cases, we'll look through DHCP options, um, where you manually set the file name, a bit like uh, you specify the Pixie Linux uh, install path. We'll do uh, DNS uh, service discovery, um, we'll look in multicast, and we'll look at your IPv6 neighbors. And then from those, um, those sources, we, we, we normally get given a, a file name, and it's, it's that file name that we'll execute. And we'll also go for a waterfall, um, a bit like that you've seen on, uh, on Pixie Boot. So we look at the, uh, this is just on, our, um, on the website for this. So these are the, the, um, the methods that we try. Um, and then we tried to find the installer on the network. So um, we start off um, specifically with the, with the architecture and the, and the vendor in, in maybe Quantor or Dell and the model number. And then we start um, filtering down until we're just looking for only dash installer. And you can also specify the uh, the parameters as part of uh, uh, DHCP options as well. Are there any questions about the discovery mechanism? Okay, um, the, the question comes up a lot. Uh, why not use P Pixie? And that, that's because Pixie's um, not readily available on the, the PowerPC platform um, at the moment. And it hasn't got support for things like IPv6. And we're seeing one of our largest deployments is a, a complete only IPv6 data center, and they've got 5,000 top of rack switches. They've got no IPv4 on the inside. Uh, at the edge of their network, they have HA proxy boxes, which have IPv4 facing out to the internet, and everything on their management domain is, is v6. Um, we can use existing uh, Linux, Linux drivers for the Ethernet management interfaces. We don't need to write new ones, and it's, it's, it makes it allows it to be um, re automated in a in a in a nice and easy fashion. So this might be a good time that we could um, I've been up with that there. I can show you a switch. 
So um, what I got, this is a, like a mosh SSH session back to um, some kit in my garage at home. Hopefully the, ah, cool, it's working. Okay, so this, uh, the, the tab on the far left is a IPPDU, so I can flip the power port on the switch. Um, okay. Cool, so the switch um, that I'll be working on is on connected up to uh, port 17. It's a, it's a Quanta LB9, so this is a 48 port 1 gig switch with four 10 gig ports. And then we just set Cool. We just connect to the serial port that's also um, hooked up to that switch. And then th this third tab is uh, the, the management server connected up to the uh, Ethernet interface. And this box is running um, DHCP and it's also got um, light HTTPD on here. So inside the var www directory, you can see we've got some in install files. So the first of those is the uh, Cumulus Linux um, binary, it's about 80 meg. Then we've got a demo installer, which is just a, a really tiny, um, like a reference OS for, for Oni that, that we've provided to other OS vendors to, to, to show how to package their operating system. Um, then we've got a sim link for the Oni dash installer pointing at Switchlight. And then this is the Switchlight installer. And Switchlight is a network operating system released by Big Switch. Okay, so if we switch on that port, hop back over here. So you can see U-boot kicking in on the switch, and it's starting up. So this box has got um, a four gig CF card in there. Okay, now a switch light starting up. I think these units are, yeah, this box is only 800 megahertz in there. So the, the thing to bear in mind is the, the actual system on chip doesn't need to be that powerful in a lot of cases because it's not, it's not actually forwarding packets. Uh, it's only sending um, instructions down to the ASIC and it's the ASIC that will be doing the wire speed routing. So in this case, um, these boxes can do, uh, they can route layer three at 960 gig a second. Um, but it's not, it's not actually that PowerPC chip that's, that's forwarding those packets. So this is um, big switch starting up. So it's just, it's just Linux. Their product does some crazy open flow stuff as well. It's just starting those agents up. So there we are, we're at the, just at the login prompt for, for switch light running on that Quanta LB9 in my garage back in Wales. Um, so say we want it, we, we, we no longer want to run switch lights um, on that on that quanta box. Maybe it doesn't it can't do um, OSPF unnumbered, or um, we want to run our own BGP daemon that we've written in Python, for example. So we can install a, a different operating system, and that's 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 really easy in this case. So what we can do is we can just remove the sim link on here. And then we just link to the, uh, the demo installer. So that's there. And then we just turn off the switch. And we pack back up. But before we do, um, what I'm going to do when the switch comes back up is start hitting enter during the boot sequence. And that'll drop me into the, the U-boot prompt. And from there, I'll start up the um, only discovery routine. Where it'll go off and it'll, it'll go through the discovery steps here. And wh what it's going to come across is the only installer file sat on our, on our web server on the management subnet. Okay, so at the prompt. So you can just see this is um, this is just UB that started up here. There's very very, very little about the box. Um, okay. 
So this is only starting. Very tiny um, Linux kernel that's going to start off onto those, th that bash uh, discovery routine. So all of our all of the discovery for, for, for locating operating systems is just a set of bash scripts that, that, that we bundle up. So you can see that um, only has got an IP on the, on the management network. And it's discovered the installer file that we placed on the, uh, on the server. So you can press enter and get to the prompt. So you can watch this while it's happening. So it's erasing the flash on the switch. And it's just going to um, as part of the operating system, and we have some checksums at the beginning of the file to verify it before we uh, DD it back out. And now the switch is just booting, and this time it will skip only, and it will drop into our our demo operating system, which is essentially um, a, just a tiny Linux kernel with a bash prompt. So we go. So we now got a, uh, a completely different operating system um, r running on the switch, and and that's what that's what we're, um, we're, we're the, the the functionality that we want to provide. We want to allow other operating system vendors to write operating systems to run on this open hardware that we're starting to see now. Um, and, and in most cases, this is the hardware that a lot of people have already got in their racks. It's just that those switches have got a Juniper logo on the front or a, a, broad, um, a Brocade logo. It's in, it's in most cases, it's, it's, uh, if it's normally, say for example, what we sometimes do is uh, I open up all these switches on the table, I take the lid off, and if you look inside, you'll just see a P2020 CPU and the normal Trident Plus um, Broadcom chipset. It's in all the vendors, they just seem to um, lay out maybe their ITC buses differently or they use different fans or power supplies. Um, so what I do now is I just kick off the install of the next OS, and then we can go back to the slides. So again, we just change the change the sim link that it will look at. And then we turn the switch off. I guess it's just got another IP and it's going to go through the discovery. So the reason you pressed return multiple times was to uh, interrupt the boot up process because else it would have uh, booted from Compact Flash, is that right? Yep. Okay, so that's the way you basically change the OS by um, getting into that environment and say, okay, boot only again to load the new image onto Compact yep. Flash. Um, we also provide um, uh, some binaries that you can include in your OS, um, or just uh, bash scripts that um, point you in the right direction of wearing the wearing the eprom to change the flag for when it boots. Um, for example, in Cumulus Linux, the OS it's installing now, we have some nice commands where you can type um, only rescue or only rediscover, and that will set those settings. So you, then you can just um, run, say, uh, CL image install dash i, and then you can just do reboot. But the, the dash i is actually setting the EEPROM setting. But in our demo OS, we don't have that, um, those, those commands there. And to be honest, the, the first OS we had on there, the big switch operating system that does OpenFlow, um, I've only ever installed that on switches. I, d I have no clue how to use it. <laughs> um, and I d we don't even know how to, how to log into it. But you, we provide that rescue mechanism, so you can always interrupt the U-boot um, to get back in. The thing we don't want to do is have only in the boot chain, um, because a lot of these big um, uh, t tenders and, and RFQs from, from large uh, data centers, they specify the amount of seconds that they can wait from the time that the switch is powered up to forwarding packets. And if we added a two or three second delay there, where only was checking for a keyboard entry, that, 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 would, that could push us over that, over, over that barrier. Um, so these are the different behaviors that, um, that only provides. So we have um, a reinstall state, which is the one that, that I was running um, manually. 
and allows you to, um, or to um, remove, remove the current OS and it'll go back to, um, to kind of a, a new out of the box state. We can uninstall where we, we take the operating system off the flash. Um, we can do a rescue and where it will just do the, the, do the repair and debug. Um, we do an update where you can use that to install a new version of Oni into the, uh, onto the boot chip. And we have um, a, a Diag function as well. And this is something that we're, um, we're trying to push hardware vendors down the road of. Um, so as well as them compiling Oni to run on their hardware, we'd like them to provide a very small Linux network operating system that you can boot up to that will do some, um, some checks, maybe some loopbacks on the ports, and it can verify that the ASIC's in a good state. Because um, we find um, that that can be very useful sort of, um, for attack cases as well. So these provide all the mechanisms you need to get your OS onto the box to be able to remove an operating system, to do recovery, and a hook to do diagnostics as well. Um, so some of the lessons that we've learned um, in the past few years of developing this, um, even within the same CPU family, P2020, across all those different vendors, everybody will be laying stuff out differently. Um, different amounts of, of cache, um, um, diff different flash types. Um, every, everybody's changing stuff, even between the same SKU um, from some vendors, um, the boards will be changing slightly. And that's something we're, we're trying to push these folk in Taiwan to, to do, is, is to actually change the part code if, if, the, if, the, if the layout's changing on the board. Because it makes a real difference for those of us that are developing operating systems. Um, hardware net vendors need the freedom to, to change the bootloader as well. Um, and, and we'd like them to push their changes back to GitHub as well. Some of them are kind of resisting that at the moment. Um, we need that mechanism to allow the, the hardware vendor to bundle their diagnostics tool. Um, and so, some things that we see, we, we, a lot of people um, are now based on this uh, TLV EEPROM format uh, for storing settings. Um, we've got a table of that out on our um, GitHub site. And um, the common hardware designs that can really reduce the, 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 t the time. So in most cases, you see that these sw switch manufacturers will just go to Broadcom and they pick up the reference design when they license the SDK. And all they do is just, move, like I was saying earlier, move around some ITC ports and some power supplies. And those, those ones are great because it means our, our, um, the bootloader will go in there quick and then you can install multiple operating systems. You don't have to be messing about where someone's changed from a CF card to, to SD between hardware revisions. Um, so what, what are we up to now with Oni? Um, Power PC, we're, we're starting to see that kind of um, uh, for phasing out in the top of rack switch market. Uh, everybody wants x86 now. So now we're seeing um, switches come along, like the Dell S6000, which either have um, dual or quad core x86, box, uh, x86 chips on there. And that allows you to do um, a lot of kind of offloading uh, some functionality in, into CPU that, that you can't do on the ASIC. Um, so we've got an x86 uh, feature set for Oni. And we have a VM available to, to prototype that. Um, we're also seeing some manufacturers think about ARM and, and, and even MIPS. And we want the behaviors of only to be consistent across the, the different architectures. And we're working with some universities in the States to, do, um, some, to put together some OCP testing labs so we can do a compliance sticker um, to, get, to give to the, the hardware manufacturers to say that they comply with this, this boot standard. And by doing that, it kind of it, it opens up the marketplace again for, for other people to get involved and develop network operating systems. So these are some of the new features we're um, actively uh, uh, testing and trying to get our V6 um, feature set uh, fixed up. Um, we're working on DNS service discovery and multicast, and this uh, hardware vendor uh, diagnostics tools. Um, we do quarterly releases. Um, ongoing maintenance, and we've had lots of contributions. So some of those uh, vendors that um, I sh showed earlier, they've, they've actively submitted patches. So if, uh, if you're looking like on, the, on the GitHub or our mailing list, one of the features that we didn't have uh, was a, a function to store a, like a service tag. And uh, that's Dell have those on everything. So they submitted a, um, a pull request on the GitHub site, and we, we accepted that. So what's our x86 strategy? Um, we can use the existing BIOS that comes on the switches. Um, in most cases, um, the switch vendor will uh, license a, a BIOS from a kind of traditional 
uh, bias um, company. Um, during manufacturing, um, in, the, in the factories, we're going to have them install GRIB2 and our only x86 release. And then the network operating system installer, um, if that's Switchlight or um, Cumulus or maybe um, the FTOS release that's going to be only compa um, compatible, will do the partitioning on the disk and it will install the software and keep the GRIB2 configuration up to date. So this is what the um, block layout will look like on the x86 boxes. We're going to have four partitions, a grid boot partition, um, the only boot partition, the only config partition. And then from partition four onwards, that's going to be free for the, um, the, the OS vendors to split up as they like. So um, in our case of partition four onwards, we're going to configure that as LVM and split it into two OSs. And then we can use snapshots. Um, to provide uh, the ability for the user to roll back the OS. So like, we're going to use um, the GPT format, um, as it's kind of widely supported now. And it will allow you to do switch between multiple operating systems easily. So the switch will just start to look like a, like a server like uh, everyone's been used to for a while. So we'll have these uh, four standard um, install options. And then after you've installed um, the OS, the network OS will appear as the fifth option, but it'll actually be the default. Um, so what does the network OS have to do? Um, it's going to create the, the pa partitions, um, install the network OS into that, that partition for onwards. Um, and then we, what we don't want to happen is for the network OS itself to be editing the grub files, because someone's going to screw up there at some point, and then you're going to end up with a, with a box that you're not going to be able to do anything on. Um, so we're going to provide um, these commands to the network OS or wrapper scripts that they can bundle in um, where we can at least sanity check uh, values before they're written to the, uh, to the grub config. We have a website for Oni, which is kind of separate from Cumulus completely. Um, the GitHub site and the documentation is on um, GitHub pages as well. Flip back to this uh, this install, so you can see here um, it went through, installed Cumulus Linux, and that's just taking us to the the, the prompt. If my wireless thing back up, <laughs> Latency. <laughs> Let's try again. Try flipping back to the different wireless. Okay. Hurry. <laughs> uh, so it's funny into our network operating system. Um, and in our case, oops, we dropped it. Back. You can see on this um, PowerPC box, we cut the um, the mass storage up into two slots, so we can have two different operating systems installed and flip between them. But we also provide a, a means if you do CLM select dash i, that'll set the, the flag um, in the EEPROM and for, so when you boot boots next time, it'll drop into the um, only rescue routine. Have we got any questions? So one more. Um, 
in terms of environmental uh, stuff, so fans, yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that, is is that standardized? Is or, um, or are only the switches that have the Broadcom uh, reference design implemented? I'll, I'll level with you. That's chaos. Chaos. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, so, in some cases. Um, you, you might find a standard Linux driver for something, or maybe in s sometimes we've seen like a one-wire bus inside the box. Um, sometimes the fans and the power supply voltages will be available on I2C. Um, and that's down to the, the network operating system to kind of standardize and have an abstraction layer between that and the user. Um, I know in our case, and maybe uh, Big Switch, you can use like LM sensors. Um, but but we have to look at which hardware we're running on, and use a different routine to access that. Any other questions? I've about only your data center switches. Repeat, please. Sorry. The last sentence is... Oh, I, 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 can I ever answer questions about only, or only or data center switches or Linux on switches, like any of those topics? Hello? Okay, I guess I'm done. <laughs> I, have, I might have some spare slides that m maybe you can... Um, So this is the um, the HCL of the different switches that we have only running on at the moment. Um, at the top, there's some 40 gig switches, and these are all in the 32 by 40 gig format. Um, those boxes are they can root um, and s and switch packets at 1.6 terabits a second line rate on every port. Um, as you can see, they're, they're all the Broadcom uh, Trident two chipset. Um, the price point you see for those 32 gig by 40 switches is is around sort of the 8,000 US dollar mark, um, and then the 10 gig switches. Um, a lot of cases they're 48 by 10 with the 440s, or we're seeing these um, much denser boxes now, the 96 by 10 um, with 840s, and one of those is, is around the sort of 4,000 euros mark for the 48 by 10 gig. Um, and then some of the smaller boxes, which I start to see people um, veer away from uh, deploying one gig in racks now because because of the ten gig price point. Um, they may be around the, the sort of two thousand euros mark. Um, but it's it's all of these that we these vendors that we've been working with to get to get only installed. And these are the ones that Cumulus Linux can run on, and then um, a subset of this, some of our um, competitors' operating systems can can run on as well. Or like in the the Dell case, you can always run that uh, traditional Force Ten OS. So those are all Broadcom reference designs. What about the Intel reference design? How far are they with the okay. reference design? And when are we going to see switches with Cumulus OS on them? On the Intel? Um, I think that there could be other ASICs that we will work on first. One's mentioned earlier, possibly like Mellanox. Um, Mellanox have ONI installed, but there's kind of a difference between the switches that support ONI and the switches that support Cumulus Linux because of the um, the, the SDK is involved in our case. Um, I, c I can't talk about kind of dates, but it will happen shortly. Um, w one thing that could indicate that way is the um, the Intel reference design that was submitted to the OCP Open Networking Project as well. Um, and I know there's a, a few big data centers working on, on those switches. Um, have one other slide here that I put in that um, some people ask about, and this is kind of how we hardware accelerate, hardware accelerate Linux and do the kind of the, the magic offload. Um, what we have is uh, a kernel module with a switch drive on the right-hand side that runs on our network OS, um, and that talks to the switching silicon, like you mentioned, is, uh, is at the moment it's a Broadcom. It's going to be the Apollo, the Triumph, the Trident Plus, or the T2. And we sync the state of um, the routing tables, ARP, um, and VLANs, uh, 
layer two and layer three ACLs of IP tables. We sync all that state from the kernel down into the ASIC. And that, that's, that's bi-directional. So we, as you add a root into Linux, we take that and we push it down into the ASIC. So it's actually the hardware the, um, ASIC that's forwarding the packets, not the Linux kernel. And then as the packets are, are passing between the switch ports, we update the, the counters in Linux against those interfaces. So we create Linux interfaces. So when you log onto the switch, um, and you do if config or IP adder or IP link, you'll see 48 network ports flash past you. And you just configure it like it's a Debian box, but with 48 NICs. And then on top of that, you can run the normal layer three tools such as Quagga or Bird that are pushing roots into the kernel. And little do they know that also happening in the kernel, we're syncing that state down into hardware. Um, and then if you wanted to do, create, say, a VLAN that you normally do with Conf T, int VLAN on the Cisco switch, um, you just create a, a Linux bridge. So you do brctl, add br, nat, and then you do add if, nat, swp1, swp2. And we sync that state again into the hardware to create a, a layer two domain with those ports in it. Um, and on top of that, you can run uh, daemons like msdpd if you, need, if you still want to an SDP. Um, or if you wanted to configure a, um, an access control list, um, like you do in Linux, you just configure it using IP tables. And we push that down into, into hardware and actually create a hardware ACL. And we do the same with um, layer two. We create a layer two ACLs of EB so, tables. So IP tables is just an abstraction for the for the ACL. Exactly. ACO. Yeah. So we want to have a uh, in our OS, we want to have a really clean divide. Of, we don't want to um, present any of the the kind of um, SDK features directly to you. So you should just better ha sim simulate it with a VM with 48 NICs. But when you run that same etc network interfaces config or quagga config on a switch it's just hardware accelerated so uh, i guess i can shoot myself into the foot if i program stuff into ip tables that can't be programmed in the hardware mm. how yeah. do i make sure that i get notified by the fact that it can't be programmed into the hardware so uh we we have a we have a hook on ip tables that won't let you add rules that aren't supported in hardware. So an example of that would be you could do layer three uh, ACLs for forwarding, but you couldn't do masquerading in hardware because the AC doesn't support it. Um, and, then and, and then you punt to the CPU, I guess. Ah, but um, see, the, the, the issue with that, if we kind of flip back to, uh, where did I have that picture? Because I already see myself troubleshooting 99% CPU cases. So. Yeah, so, so in this case, um, we try to push everything down, uh, down into that ASIC on the right-hand side. Um, but we, pre we simulate those, those ports in Linux as tap devices. So traffic isn't actually flowing there. Um, you, can do t you can run TCP dump and stuff on there. But the thing to bear in mind, between the system on chip and the ASIC, there's only actually a 500 megabit bus in most cases. So you could have this fantastic box with 32, 40 gig ports, and you think, oh, great, this would be awesome. I'm going to install HA proxy on there, or I'm going to terminate all my PPP users on there, or an OPVPN. But all that stuff's actually going to be happening in the CPU, and, you're only, and you'd be better off buying a $99 server on eBay and shoving a 10 gig NIC in it and hooking it up, hooking it up to a switch than trying to run um, CPU-bound bound apps. So um, running Linux on the switch is great for automation. You can uh, build out your cross fabric really easily. We use tools like Puppet and Chef, managing um, lots of VLANs, um, using tools like Quagra and Bird. But for those tools, where you, those issues where you want to do lots of um, layer four and seven stuff, um, you still need to run that in like a, a kind of classic x86 server. At the moment, until, until that changes when you see the, the system on chip move from current generation PowerPC with the 800 megahertz to, to possibly um, x86 quad core or hex core CPUs in the switch as well. And what we'd like to see is uh, manufacturers increase the speed of that, the interface between the two. Some of the initial designs we've seen, it's still got a 500 meg uh, bottleneck there. And it'd be really nice if they still had that PCI bus, but they actually flip one of the 40 gig ports and they flip it back into the CPU as well. So then you can start running those tools on there. So you could do like, you're saying um, uh, you, you maybe you want to do, run some natting or something that isn't supported on the ASIC. You might want to run that on the, on the CPU.
just just a question. Um, we have seen in standard x86 servers where we run bonding, yep. VLANs, and a bridge together to hook up virtual machines. And we have seen that when you go past four gigabits, it's, yeah, the performance is not scaling linear. Yeah. Then we moved on to Open vSwitch, yeah. which is, yeah, you can saturate one 10 gig link without any problems with few machines. Yeah. So how much code do you share or have you solved the problem with like Cumulus Linux itself? Um, can you explain a little bit or it's disclose it? So if, you, if it, all the control is happening in Linux, but the packets are never actually hitting the Linux kernel. So I could have a Debian box with an 800 megahertz CPU that looks to all intents and purposes like it's forwarding 960 gig a second of traffic and the counters are updating because the packet is only flying through, through here. It's never actually hitting the kernel. But you think it's hitting the kernel because we push the counters back. So on this, on the, in Linux, you could run collect D and you see it look like it's actually forwarding. But it's, like, it's like trick play. So it's like the model um, in the um, open flow. You remove the control plane from the data plane? Yep. Okay. I got and, it. and you still configure it. So, say so you had a, the Linux a KVM box with some bonds. So, in our case, you create a Linux bond, and you just as you would on a software router, we turn that into a lag, and you create all the bridges, and you just attach them. You create um, sub interfaces like SWP 1.100, and you map it into the bridge, and you set it up just like it's your software box, but it's all happening in hardware, and the switch D process on the right hand side keeps all that in sync. But there's lots of vendors that are, are doing similar stuff to ourselves and now trying to use Oni to do that. So um, people like Pika 8 you might have heard of or Big Switch, they've all got kind of a different take on it. And, and our view is we'd, we'd like to have that separation between the ASIC and the kernel and just have an abstraction layer. Cool. Are there any other questions for Rob? Cool. Thank you. Thank you.